Thanks very much. As you know, um, my name's uh, Garon Scher. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. And uh, Paul Mason and I in the clinic often have uh, topics of discussion that we say, well, you know, what do we know about and what do we need to learn more about? And uh, then we go away and research and come back and talk to each other. And unfortunately, I was one, the one that was allocated the topic of artificial sweeteners because I went down an enormous rabbit hole trying to research this over many uh, weeks and hours to try and get some reasonable information uh, that I could present to you. Now, if we go back to sort of medical school, I was taught that the sweet taste fibres were at the tip of your tongue and the back of your, your tongue as well, but in, in, act, in actual fact, it turns out that that's not true. So before we talk about artificial sweeteners, we need to talk about how and why we taste foods. So generally speaking, in the past, bitter things were dangerous for us and poisonous, and we stayed away from them. Sweet things were nutritionally dense, so we tended to eat them. So um, that's something that historically has been the case. So taste is the sensation produced when a substance in the mouth reacts chemically with taste receptor cells, which are found in the mouth. So what happens is you get a chemical reacting on a specialized nerve ending, which sends a signal to the brain. So we've got to have the chemical and the sensory receptor there. Now it turns out that Taste is, sweet taste is actually in many more places rather than just the front and the back of the tongue. So the process starts with saliva dissolving the, uh, it's dissolving the food with the enzymes and then they're washed over the papillae as we um, swallow them. But that's really only one part of taste because the other past part is smell. Um, and there's a nerve called the trigeminal nerve <coughs> which senses texture, pain and temperature and it determines the flavour as well as the pure taste. I mean, you all know that when you smell the, a coffee and then you taste the coffee, the smell and the taste aren't always matched together. And a lot of the time it actually doesn't taste as good as what it smelled. And that's the same when you're walking past the candy shop somewhere like Disneyland and they've got the wafting out of that, that flavour. It's designed to make the taste seem better. So um, there are, in fact, sweet, ta uh, sweet receptors through your oropharynx, your pancreas, your gut. They're, in fact, all over the place, not just in your tongue. Now, sweetness is detected by these things called G-protein coupled receptors, which you see a couple of on the screen. Um, they form this uh, G protein called uh, gustusin, I think that's how you pr pronounce it, uh, which are found on the taste buds. And you need at least two of these to be activated in order to taste sweetness. They, it, it, it activates an, a cyclase enzyme which helps produce CAMP, which closes potassium ion channels, which leads to depolarization. What does that mean? There's a series of chemical events which eventually send a signal to your brain which uh, tells you that you've tasted something sweet. Um, the compounds that the brain senses are sweet are compounds that can bind with the various bond strengths to these two different sweetness receptors, and they're called T1R2 plus 3 and T1R, T, T1R3. But synthetic sweeteners, like saccharin, activate different forms of these and induce taste receptor cell depolarization by a different pathway. Now, a lot of the time, it's, um, t the, the threshold is measured against sucrose, which is table sugar, glucose, and uh, fructose, and that's given an index of one when we're testing whether things are more or less sweet. <clears throat> now, let's talk about the bliss point. As, it, as, it, as its name implies, the bliss point is the combined sensory profile at which you like food the most. Now, it's not just the flavour, it's the texture as well, and also, very importantly, whether you f feel full afterwards. Because if, if you can eat something and not feel full, then you'll quite happily eat more of it. Whereas if you eat something and you feel full, you won't want to eat more. So scientists have worked out the fat to salt to sugar ratio, which best gives them this bliss point, which then also doesn't make us hungry, which makes us eat more. And this can be scientifically worked out. So um, one of the things that, uh, that I've noticed as I went low carb is that my palate changed and things that I used to 
have my bliss point at, I no longer do because my sensitivity with these sweet receptors has changed completely. So the scientific calculated bliss point of someone on a regular carb diet and a low carb diet will be different. And so I'm no longer tempted after three, four years uh, by those foods as I used to be. Now one of the things that, that we think is that insulin secretion signaling will lead to suppression of sweet taste. So the more insulin you've got in your system, the more you're going to need to have sweet stuff to be able to get that same feeling. And that glucagon enhances sweet taste perception. So if your glucagon goes up, you'll need less of that sweet stuff. And in fact, there's a whole book that's been written about this by Michael Moss, uh, Salt, Sugar and Fat, which makes fascinating reading. Um, in response to a positive stimulus, the, the brain responds with a reward. You get dopamine going into your brain and that gives you a pleasure response. And people that are significantly overweight need more dopamine to get that same feeling, so they're going to have to eat more sugar to get that same end result. And those pathways are pretty much the same for drug addiction, cocaine, heroin, as what they are for sugar. Now, this graph shows the relative sweetness of various products. If we look at the relative um, uh, sweetness of fructose, you can see that it's nearly double what glucose is. And since we crave sweet foods, it's one of the reasons that fruit is so enticing to us because of the fructose, as well as products with high, corn, uh, high, yeah, high fructose corn syrup. Um, we'll explore the sweetness of artificial sweet, sweetness a little bit later. <clears throat> now, how to categorize sweetness? Well, it depends who you're talking to. If you're talking to a chef, if you're talking to a scientist, if you're talking to a baker, they're all gonna think about different things and they're all going to give you different responses of how they think about it. Is it heat stable? It, can it be in a liquid? Can it be in a powder? Um, is it natural? Is it artificial? So there's no real good classification. One of the simple ways of thinking about it is simply uh, as you see on the screen, sugars down to artificial sweetness. Um, most sugars are, are labelled with the ending O's, O-S-E, glucose, fructose, uh, and the, the naturally occurring sugars we're most familiar with are glucose and fructose, but there's a lot of others, Mal maltose, lactose, which is found in milk, galactose, and eventually these are broken down and used by our body for energy. They're typically in a ring structure, often bound together, um, and uh, sucrose is the combination of the two together. But you've got to be a bit careful because when you're reading a nutrition label, you might see something like white or brown sugar, you might see uh, honey, malt syrup, cane juice, cane syrup, rice syrup, barley syrup, maple syrup, molasses, and all of these sound like they might be better for you than eating sugar. But at the end of the day, it becomes glucose. And be particularly aware of products that say no added sugar because almost always what they've got some sort of concentrated grape or apple juice which is extremely high in fructose used as the sweetener. All right, so let's talk about sugar alcohols now. So a little bit of science here. A polyol is an organic compound containing more than two hydroxyl groups. Those are the OH things that you see on the screen. Sugar alcohols which are polyols, are usually made by adding hydrogen to sugar. So at the top we have erythritol and at the bottom we have sorbitol. And you see neither of them has a ring structure like glucose did. Despite the alcohol part of the name, they don't contain any ethanol, which is what we think of as alcohol. Now sugar alcohols have a similar chemical structure to sugar. They do activate the sweet taste receptors on your tongue. So malitol, sorbitol, xylitol, erythritol, these are the things that we're talking about. Now, a lot of these are found naturally in fruits and vegetables, but in order to get them to high enough concentrations, it's not really uh, practical to do that, so most of them are processed from other sugars. Now, unlike the artificial and low-calorie sweeteners, most sugar alcohols do, do contain calories, just less than what sugar does. So, for example, uh, 2.6 calories per gram versus 4 calories per gram is for most of them. They're also partially resistant to digestion, so, so they will pass through your system. And you all heard of FODMAP. Well, the P in the FODMAP is for polyols, and if you have any sensitivity to it, you're going to end up getting stomach upset and bloating. And an enormous amount of people, when they have these sugar alcohols, and it's, it's almost <coughs> dose dependent that you can guarantee that it will happen to you. These are less sweet than sucrose, so you need more of them to be able to do that. 
So they, are, they are, have a lower calorie content um, and they're often unfortunately mixed with the high intensity sweeteners to increase the sweetness. So even if you've got a sugar alcohol, almost always there'll be something else with it. They're white, water soluble solids that are used widely as both thickeners and sweeteners. And if you start looking for them, you'll see them. Um, because they're not broken down by the bacteria um, in the mouth or metabolized to acids, you'll often find these in chewing gum because they don't actually contribute to tooth decay. They give you the sweet taste in the gum, you can chew them quite safely for your teeth, but if you read the warning label, a lot of the chewing gums will say, be careful because you're going to get diarrhea if you drink too much of this. Um, and you probably need to restrict your intake to you know, less than 40 to 50 grams a day as, a, as an adult. Um, so these are examples of products that sugar alcohols are used in and you'll see advertised as being diabetic friendly uh, and you'll often see nutrition labels that just say additive with a number. So for example, additive 967 is xylitol, 420 is sorbitol. So you may not even realise with the food that you're eating that you're eating one of these FODMAP type things, the polyols. Erythritol, which is 968, is particularly uh, used widely in soft drinks and lozenges um, and even uh, doing something like making a fondant for a cake, which is lower in sugar. So what about the insulin response? Because this is one of the things that we're, you know, everyone wants to know about. And um, I, when I started reading this, whenever I found a blog or a paper, I would actually go to the link that the person quoted when they were uh, referencing something. You know, it caused an insulin response and then they'll put a, a, a reference there. When I went to that reference, a third of the time the reference, in fact, was completely wrong. Another third of the time the reference had nothing to do with that particular topic. And a third of the time it was actually relevant, and, but quite a few people had misinterpreted what the paper had, had said because they'd just read the conclusion and not read the paper. So be very careful when you're reading blogs and even scientific papers, don't necessarily read the conclusion, read the body to learn about what it is. So erythritol, um, in term, uh, well, sorry, um, malitol, sorbitol and xylitol do give you an insulin response to about half of that of sugar. Uh, erythritol um, does seem to give you a minimal, a minimal response. Um, and so you have to be careful which of these you're using and what it's combined with. But for people with insulin resistance, using certainly the top three will cause a, a, a block of weight loss and promote poor metabolic health. What about the safety? Um, essentially, there are so many studies showing uh, good and bad things that it's very difficult to draw a conclusion. Certainly it's dose dependent with how much diarrhea and bloating you get. Otherwise, it appears to be reasonably safe if you're metabolically unwell. But just remember, if you're using an artificial sweetener to um, have these baked sugary foods, you're avoiding eating the healthy, nutritious, whole foods that you should be eating. So safety does not necessarily equal health. All right, what about the natural caloric sweeteners? These are not carbohydrates and they contain far fewer calories. It's only recently in America, in recent years, America and Australia have had more of these uh, used. So the, um, the, the most well-known is probably stevia, and it's relatively healthy for your teeth. But they do have an aftertaste which is quite bitter. Um, again, you'll notice the different chemical structure, uh, and the monk fruit is another one. So it's derived from a South American shrub, and steviol glycosides and steviol and steviol interact with a protein channel called TRPM5. So that's different from the sugar pathway. And, and that gives you a signal from both your sweet and bitter receptors, which why you start off sweet and kind of end up a bit af bitter afterwards. And, and the, the synergistic effect, that means the combined effect of the, of the glycosides and the sweet receptor and the TRPM5 explains the sweet sensation that you get. But be very careful. Stevia often is not pure. It's often mixed with sugars and sweeteners in the form that it's sold. So if you are going to use it, you have to be very, very careful to use pure steviol. Now, it can't be further digested in the dis digestive tract um, it's taken up in the bloodstream and metabolized by the liver um, and then excreted in the urine. What about the insulin response? Well, it doesn't appear that it causes an insulin response 
in, on its own, but it does appear, appear to improve insulin sensitivity in the pancreas. Um, now, this could be a problem, because if you're on a drug like an S, S, uh, GLT2 inhibitor, and you produce more insulin in response to this without providing glucose at the same time, you could potentially end up with something like diabetic ketoacidosis as a result of the drug. And that's one of the reasons that we suggest that people stop these drugs when they're going on a ketogenic diet. But overall, that the, the, this particular drug is quite dangerous. And I've had a couple of patients unrelated to this who have gotten infections and ended up in intensive care. So we need to be very careful. It's an area that we don't know a lot about and we're still learning. Um, and if, they, if, the, uh, if the stevia is combined with dextrose or maltodextrin, that definitely will give you a blood sugar rise. Uh, side effects, well, I wasn't able to find any negative side effects. Um, it's being approved by the FDA. Uh, it, it's the GRAS is generally recognised as safe for classification, but there are some studies showing that um, the gut microbiome is affected. Now, a lot of people say it affects it positively, but it actually, the, the jury's not out on that because some of the positive effects of the uh, gut microbiome are on uh, bacteria that we don't actually need and it does tend to suppress some of the ones that we do need. So I'm not sure about the answer to that. There are also anecdotal studies on liver stress, pancreas stress, but it's really hard to know. I mean, there's whole books written on this, like this one called The Stevia Deception, which has, you know, four or five hundred pages telling you how bad it is. What about um, oligofructan? So um, this is, the term saccharide is another word for sugar, and an oligosaccharide is a molecule made of a small group of these sugars. So again, you see the ring structure and they're all linked together. So fructo-oligosaccharides, or FOS, are often called um, oligofructans, and are actually short-chain fibres derived from something called inulin. Um, they exhibit sweetness about 30 to 50% of sugar and have been used commercially since about the 1980s and are often combined with other structures. All right, what about artificial sweeteners? So what's in a name? They're often called high-intensity sweeteners, artificial sweeteners, artificially sweetened beverages, low-calorie sweeteners. They, they really have no nutrient value to the, the human body. They provide a sweet taste to the sensation, ideally without raising bl blood sugar levels. So uh, again, one of the classifications is to uh, look at it into organic acid or peptide and peptide derivatives, but it really didn't help very much in my thinking to understand all of these. So I'm, I'm going to briefly go through these. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time because most of this is available on the internet if you just go and put the name in. The stories of how these products were discovered is actually quite interesting. Virtually all of them were accidental discoveries in a lab somewhere where somebody was working on something else, spilled it on their finger, tasted it. Oh, that's sweet. Okay, let's work out what that is. And that's happened two or three times with the various artificial sweeteners that they have. Um, it seems that the FDA feels that it's safe because it's excreted unchanged via the kidneys. Um, it's 300 times sweeter than sugar. It gets unstable when it's heated. Um, and as far as I could tell, it doesn't increase glucose or blood sugar. Is there an insulin response? Well, it might. The studies are very small and inconclusive, and there are as many studies showing yet, saying yes as no. But, you know, that could pro possibly be problematic if, if weight loss is your goal. What about safety? Well, in rat studies, it certainly caused lots of problems, uh, you know, including depressed growth and anemia. And based on that, I think it would be reasonable to say that if you're uh, you know, a kid, pregnant or breastfeeding, then it's probably not a good idea to consume these, although there isn't human uh, evidence one way or the other. All right, what about um, cyclamate? Well, again, 30 to 50 times uh, sweeter than sucrose. Uh, it's less expensive and, and it, it seems to be used reasonably well for um, cooking and baking. Again, it was uh, discovered in the, the 1930s um, at, at the University of Illinois where he was uh, working on uh, synthesizing anti-fever medication. Uh, he, apparently his cigarette, which was being used in the lab at that stage, he used to smoke back then in the labs, uh, so the cigarette touched it when he put it in his mouth, he, he tasted the sweetness. Um, 
The metabolism in men and animals is extremely uh, variable with this particular product, so you can't really draw conclusions uh, about one uh, particular side effect. Uh, it has been banned in the US, and to my knowledge is still banned in the US because of some of the early studies. Um, what about ACE-K, ace sulfate and potassium? Uh, 200 times sweeter than, than uh, saccharin, uh, so than sucrose, I beg your pardon. Uh, discovered in the late 1960s, he licked his fingers again while working in the lab, and in 1998 the FDA approved, that, approved it for use in beverages, and in 2003 it was approved for use in general foods, except meat or poultry. Now why you would need to have a sweetener for meat and poultry is beyond me, but that's what, they, that's what the rule is. They're not allowed to use it for meat or poultry. Um, it doesn't have any calories in it. You get a stable blood sugar level because it doesn't have any carbohydrates. And in rat studies, it significantly increased the insulin response because it worked directly on the pancreas. But does that mean that'll happen in humans? We don't really know the answer. It's been used to decrease the bitter aftertaste of aspartame and uh, can be found in NutraSweet containing products. What about the insulin response? Well, as I said, rat studies. And again, I don't know the answer to this, but it concerns me greatly with people on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Safety, well, when you go very high dose, there are concerns about interaction with DNA at high doses, and that potentially could lead to genetic damage and lead to problems in the future. And these are the sorts of things. You'll see it's additive number 950, and, and these are the sorts of things that you'll find it in, in Australia. What about aspartame? Well, it's the most popular artificial uh, sweetener in use today. It's calorie and carbohydrate free, not ideal for cooking because it breaks down under heat. Now, another one of these, uh, this is another one of these things that uh, something spilled on the hand, they licked it, and I just can't understand all these lab guys licking their fingers. It's just beyond me. But I guess that was a long time ago. These days with everyone being a bit more paranoid, hopefully that sort of thing doesn't happen, and now it's done in a more controlled fashion. So this was uh, approved in about 1981 um, by the FDA, and uh, it's been used in more than 6,000 products by hundreds of millions of people. And that's why uh, one of the arguments is that it, that it might be safe, uh, because uh, we would have seen the effects of it by now if we were going to. But it does contain something called phenylalanine, and if you're a phenylketonuric, this will build up in your system because you can't break it down, and that's very dangerous. Um, so that if, if, you, if you have that condition, you need to avoid that. So the insulin response, it does not appear to uh, raise glucose and insulin levels in humans. And um, the, one of the issues is recently there's been some studies uh, showing the effect on gut bacteria. And there is a, a link between gut bacteria, obesity, and general health as well. So the advice is probably that you should just use it short term if you're going to use it. Neotame is uh, the newest artificial sweetener. It's only been around since 2002, and there has been at least one study showing a rise with glucose and insulin uh, with that, but you're not going to have any problems if you have fetal ketonuria. So sucralose is a slightly different thing. It's, it's, a, it's a sucrose molecule in which three of the hydroxyl groups, those OH groups, have been replaced by chlorine atoms. Uh, again, 1976. Um, they, they were looking for, to, for products to use sucrose as, as, an, as an intermediate. And the story goes that a graduate uh, student whose English was not perfect uh, heard uh, the request for testing of the product as tasting of the product. And he tasted it and it was sweet and they went forward from there. Um, but it's 600 times uh, sweeter than sugar. So these are great stories. Uh, it does cause an insulin response, and if you look in the top right-hand corner, you see the two graphs uh, diverge between water and sucralose in terms of the insulin. So uh, you might find that weight gain or difficulty with weight loss if you're using this particular product. Um, Trehalose, uh, Richard mentioned uh, briefly beforehand, and, and um, it's used by bacteria, fungi, uh, and plants, invertebrate animals, um, as a source of energy and to survive freezing and lack of water. Um, because it, it changes the freezing point of the water, which is why it's used so much in frozen products like ice creams. Extracting it used to be very expensive and, and quite difficult, uh, but a Japanese cover uh, company found a way to do it relatively cheaply. 
So um, C. diff or Clostridium difficile uh, are in the um, gut uh, normally, um, but uh, Trehalose was introduced in about 2000, and all of a sudden we had a huge spike in hospital acquired C. difficile infections happening at about the same time. Now, if you're expecting long-term uh, effects like you know, five or 10 years later, then something being introduced then and then getting uh, sick five or 10 years down the track is what you'd expect. But if it's a direct effect on your gut microbiome, this is the sort of pattern that you'd expect. Immediately it was introduced into the food chain, you'd get immediate responses, and that's why probably this is true, but I look forward to Richard's uh, dissertation next year. Um, so if we look at the artificial sweeteners generally and ask, are they safe? Well, studies leading to FDA approval have ruled out, in inverted commas, the cancer risk. Um, we know that they induce bladder cancer in rats when uh, fed in high doses, but you know that may be to do with uh, the uh, rat excretion being difficult to ours. There are different to ours. There are lots and lots and lots of blogs telling you that they're not safe, but I really wasn't able to find categorical evidence one way or the other. Uh, but the question is, it's, uh, it's not just about that. What about metabolic syndrome? What about type 2 diabetes? And these really are linked quite strongly <coughs> with that. Do they work? Well, let's look at a review of the reviews. So these three authors got together and looked at all of the systematic reviews that had been done. And this is a fairly busy slide. But if you basically had sponsorship or funding from either the sugar people or the non-sugar people, your study showed a benefit for sugar if you are sponsored by sugar people, or sweeteners if you are swallowed, followed by the sponsored by the non the, by the sweetener people, and it really is quite incredible that the more conflict of interest you have, the more likely that your studies to show what you want. What's worse is if you actually go through the study and see whether the conclusion matches the data in the paper. Most of these studies, there was no concordance, that means there was no match between the conclusion drawn and the data in the paper. So we have to be very careful even of the science. So recent reviews of studies have shown that, um, that the sweeteners can be helpful, can be harmful, or have yet unclear effects. So what do we do? Which science do we believe? So, what about the fact that you say, look, I can give up diet drinks whenever I want to, right? Don't be so sure. There's a study which exposed rats to cocaine and got them fairly addicted to it, and then gave them a choice between the intravenous cocaine and the saccharin. Guess what the rats chose most of the time? Most chose saccharin over the cocaine. It gave them more of a dopamine response than what the cocaine did. The San Antonio Heart Study, the risk of weight gain and obesity was significantly greater in those consume, consuming artificially sweetened beverages compared to people that didn't. The Nurses Health Study, increased risk of type 2 diabetes consuming at least one artificially sweetened or sugar sweetened beverage. And the EPIC study, uh, which Jason referred to before, you're, you are likely to get type 2 diabetes if you drink one of these even if you had normal weight at baseline. Hypertension and cardiovascular disease also increased. What about diabetes? Well, if you drink one of these, you have an 18% increase in type 2 diabetes. Adjusted for adiposity, yeah, if you're less fat, it's down to 13%. And the studies just show the same thing again and again and again. Even fruit juice causes is more, more likely to lead to diabetes, but less than what an artificially sweetened beverage would. Um, and there was no um, benefit in these studies of use, using an art artificial sweetened beverage or fruit juice over a sugar sweetened beverage in terms of the outcome. Um, so the link between calories and um, sweetness, well, they play a trick on your body. You know, you get the sweet taste, you're expecting the calories and it doesn't happen. Um, and, and you tend to choose sweet food over nutritious food and all of these can lead to weight gain. Uh, brain, brain activation in uh, artificially sweetened beverage drinkers, well, it's different when you activate sucrose in 
sweeten, sweetener drinkers and people that don't drink sweeteners. So it's not as simple as the sweeteners are okay or not okay purely from an insulin and cancer risk perspective. So these are, um, uh, you know, individuals have individual risks to artificial sweeteners. What's good for the metabolically healthy endurance athlete may not work for the pre-diabetic office worker. Uh, we have very highly individualized systems and it probably is that you'll have to try a little bit and see what works for you and what doesn't. But here's a couple of our very happy patients from our clinic uh, who without artificial sweeteners have turned their lives around and lost massive amounts of weight. As a brief summary, there's really no healthy, inexpensive and safe sweetener available that tastes just like sugar. They all have to be used in slight different combinations. Remember that weight's com combined by many, many different hormones. Insulin's probably the most important. And don't worry too much about sweetness. Keep your carbs low, your tastes will adjust, and eat healthy whole foods, not sweetness. Thank you.